It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Randy Kay, and we're going to be, and we're going to be discussing his book, Dying to Meet Jesus, How Encountering Heaven Changed My Life. Randy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. Great to be here. Well, Randy, let's kick off our conversation with a bit of what we might call the Randy K origin story. So for the listeners, the viewers, those who are encountering you for the very first time in our talk today, what are a few things they need to know about you? I was the Saul before Paul. You know, I was an ardent agnostic. So I was one uh, that tried to disprove Christianity at Northwestern University. I joined a team of fellow agnostics and we plugged in data points to a big computer system at Northwestern to invalidate all of the religions of the world. And so we thought we would be successful and we were. Uh, We actually invalidated uh, most of the religions of the world as uh, either a fusion of beliefs or as a single founder who espoused some great philosophy or awareness. Uh, There was only one that that we were not able to invalidate, and that was the God of the Bible, uh, the Judeo-Christian God. So, um, you know, that even as a skeptic, uh, I had to come to the conclusion since I knew that Jesus had said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me that that was an exclusivity that many religions did not have or most, if not all. So I knew I had to come to terms with that. Just knowing the pages in the Bible wasn't enough, however, for me. I was uh, what one might call an intellectual skeptic. I consider myself now as having been a stupid skeptic uh, in that um, I knew enough to, uh, to disbelieve, but not enough spiritually to believe. So I had to go through an arduous walk to really come to a personal relationship because I cried out to an unknown God that, you know, if you're out there, uh, if, if you're real, I need to know you as personally as I know the people that I care for, the people in my life, the loved ones in my life. And until that happened, I wasn't going to, um, acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Lord and savior. In a moment, I'd like to get to your near-death experience, but I think it'd be helpful if you would kind of set the stage for us, like uh, what was going on in your life, like what, what, where were you at career-wise and family-wise? Because I I feel like that gives the backdrop uh, that that is important context for your story. Yeah, I was at um, one of the highest points, one of the lowest points. So I've always been uh, in the business world, business community. Uh, I was directing an operations for a pharmaceutical company about to launch, uh, we never call in pharmaceutical a, a drug a cure, but this was as close to a cure as possible for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we were seeing people just virtually coming alive. And so I flew out to Washington, D.C. We brought the scientists with us and uh, I had a publicity department uh, and we had booked him on all of the major stations, uh, Fox, CNN, ABC, NBC, and so forth. Uh, This particular drug and the research was uh, on the front cover of Time magazine. And so we were on top of the world. And then uh, what happened is that the drug was withdrawn by the FDA because in the final stage of the clinical trials before it went to market, Uh, There was uh, a little bit more than a handful of people who developed encephalitis, a swelling in the brain that, uh, you know, can or cannot be lethal. So they pulled it off. And then our CFO had done some off-balance accounting. While legal, it appeared that he was cooking the books, and that appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So the stocks went uh, from the fastest-growing pharma company in the world to uh, almost a penny stock. And uh, so I started a a biotech company with a group. Uh, We had divested that after needing to to raise approximately $60 million to keep that company afloat. 
Then of all things, I bought a media company, uh, which uh, was not in my lane, but I did study journalism at Northwestern University. And I started with Chicago Tribune uh, writing for them. And so I thought, well, you know, it might be fun to, to buy a newspaper. And I did that. And we found that the advertisers uh, were not fully on board, unbeknownst to us, in acquiring it. So we had a number of them that prior to acquiring it had already said that they were going to uh, fall out. So that was our revenue stream. So it was a series of being in the high, uh, you know, the mountainside, so to speak, to now being in the valley. And so I had exhausted uh, much of my resources uh, to the point where I was thinking, what what am I going to do? I'm I'm virtually destitute at that point. And I remember sitting in a coffee shop with my wife. It was a Christian coffee shop. And I said, um, you know, at least we have our health. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, God seems to have allowed uh, all of it to evaporate with the exception of our health. And two weeks later, I came back from an interview uh, which, with a major healthcare company and um, I had a soreness in my calf. And uh, I was about to find out that um, that even that uh, would be lost. Well, one of the things I remember, uh, and, I, and I listened to your story uh, in audiobook form, uh, typically, like a lot of us guys, you really tried to stick it out and not go to the doctor until uh, the, no. the, the, really the last moment, like things got worse and worse, and you couldn't ignore it. And so uh, I guess, t- take us into that part of the journey in terms of, you know, what was happening? What were you experiencing? And then, you know, just bring us into the emergency room, the hospital. Tell, tell us the whole story. Yeah, I should have known better. I mean, I had led clinical teams, so in neurology and cardiology, but I, we were planning a trip to uh, the Sierra Mountains with my family, a, a long, you know, I won't say deserved, but a weighted trip. And so I did let it go. I did not um, go into the doctor thinking I would until, you know, I my calf had basically swollen to almost uh, one and a half times its size. And then my breathing worsened to the point where I couldn't go from the kitchen to empty the trash without feeling heaviness in my chest. And I have asthma. And so I had other uh, breathing conditions, COPD. So I just passed that off as as soreness. I had been exercising uh, previous to this, uh, taking a bicycling trip. And so I thought it was just from that as well as the calf strained muscle and then the asthma. So I went into the, the orthopedic surgeon for some painkillers and um, was rushed to the emergency room after that. So after an ultrasound CAT scan and a number of other tests, D-dimer tests, what's called to, uh, to test uh, the ability or the, the coagulation of the blood, meaning blood clotting. It was found that I had uh, six blood clots by this time because I had let it go. The blood clots had traveled from my calf all the way up through my leg into my what's called a pulmonary artery, which is the main airway that allows us to breathe. Now, my biggest fear in life and uh, bar none was the inability to breathe. I said, God, you know, before this, because I had suffered from asthma and breathing problems, I said, you know, if you want to take me, take me with a heart attack or, or, you know, whatever it is, I can probably endure that, but just let me breathe because I know, knew how precious breathing was. And at this point, I couldn't breathe. Um, my airway was completely blocked. And so I needed a uh, airway device to uh, to allow me to to gain oxygen. I was deprived of that. Um, the decision was whether to keep me there or transfer me to a specialist. Um, it was about a little more than half an hour away to perform surgery to crack the chest uh, and remove the blood clots. But uh, it was determined by that time that if uh, by the time I had gotten to the hospital, I'd be dead. Because in pulmonary uh, emboli, which is the third leading cause of death, um, you know, a patient in end stage, which was my case, could die in a matter of seconds or minutes. And in fact, there was a 27-year-old uh, surfer, because uh, I live in San Diego, who had died uh, that very day uh, from that same thing. So it's determined that, uh, you know, it's kind of a wait and see game at that point. Uh, and... 
I remember thinking, Lord, you know, I don't want to be a vegetable. You know, if it comes to that point, just take me, take me, excuse me. And I, you know, I had uh, young children at the time and I wanted um, desperately to know how they were going to be taken care of. Uh, and I had all of these worries swirling in my mind. So I was waiting in the room and the doctor came in to draw blood. So, well, this is strange. And that's not something a patient wants to hear <laughs> at that point. He said, I can't draw any blood from you. And what had happened is they left the IV in my arm for too long. They hadn't changed it. And through the IV entered uh, MRSA, which is a drug-resistant bacteria. And now that was coursing throughout my body. So on top of the pulmonary embolism, I had MRSA, a bacterial uh, infection, which caused sepsis, which is endemic throughout the entire body. And what that did is it caused a state of hypercoagulability, which is that I was clotting all over. And... Um, that's why he couldn't draw the blood out. It was like a traffic jam in the arteries, you know, and they did the, the cars were corpuscles, red blood cells in this case, clumping together. Uh, so it was at that point that I started convulsing and everything went dark and, um, and I died. My heart stopped. And um, this was for, uh, we think, a period of about 30 minutes. And that's when I met Jesus. And this is the part where i um, thinking about it, that um, I start to um, uh, become emotional. Uh, I learned from John Burke, by the way, that I went to a conference. He wrote the foreword for my book. And I got to meet other NDE people. And I spoke with John Burke, who wrote the definitive uh, book, I think, on NDE people from the Christian perspective called uh, Imagine Heaven. And he said, you know, when we go there uh, to the time we're in heaven, um, it is vivid. It's not like any other memory. It's not a memory just that uh, like from a dream, a faded memory. It's you're in the moment. And it's as real uh, virtually as it was at that time. So um, I don't know if you want me to continue on as to what happened there. but this. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, I'll, and I'll just say John Burke has been a guest on the show in the past. And uh, I'll just to, to vouch for his book. Imagine Heaven is a fantastic book. It's probably one of the best books I've encountered in the Christian publishing space uh, as far as a, a real balanced and solid view of uh, a biblical understanding of near-death experiences. So if you haven't read John's book, uh, I highly recommend that. Um, Randy, I would love to have you just take us, you know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing in terms of your encounter with Jesus, what that looked like, um, what was that experience like? We'd just uh, love to hear more about that. It's a very ethereal experience. You know, it's, it's um, you and I being people of words, uh, to put much of it in words is extraordinarily challenging because it's a little bit like, from my perspective, uh, looking at a beautiful landscape and then all of a sudden you're in the landscape. And what you observed as beauty from a distance, now you're immersed in it. And um, I think John Burke, uh, the, his analogy is going from, you know, a, 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 two, a 2D or 3D to a 4D. And so I was, um, everything had, there was a darkness, but there was a light that was shining from, uh, from above. And that almost sounds cliche, but it was so, so bright, so brilliant that I, I felt as though I couldn't look at it, um, except I would be blinded. And I was, and the, the light was infusing through the dark space to the point where it was turning as I was rising from above and I could faintly see my body at the inception. As I was rising above, uh, it was turning from from pitch black to to lighter colors. And then I looked out in the distance and saw strange figures out in the distance and they seemed to be battling each other, uh, kind of warrior figures on the on one side or the other. And I didn't know what that was about. But I did know that um, I needed to call out uh, Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, and I did. I just cried. And see, I'm, I'm there. Um, the next um, moment, um, 
there's a figure that is um, that that is soft, and um, his cheek is against my cheek, and um, he's holding me really tightly, tightly, and um, I didn't turn um, to him, but I I I knew that it was Jesus, and um, and he. And for a while, we didn't have to talk because it was there was a there was a communion. He knew my thoughts. I knew I knew his. And then he whispered to me, um, trust me. He didn't have to say I love you because his love the first time in my life, I felt the presence of love in a complete way. The Bible talks about now we see dimly then face to face. Uh I knew love in the person of Jesus Christ in a way that was apart from an action or an emotion or anything of that sort. It was an immersion in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was my friend. He was my companion. I felt like I was an audience of one, that there was no one else in the world, even though I knew the cares of the world were on his, were on his shoulders. I felt like there was no one else but him and me. And um, when I looked into his eyes, they tunneled through me and everything that was dark was exposed by his light. And uh, I knew that all the cares of the world, everything that I had worried about, every fear, and I was a fearful person. And I didn't even believe in NDEs until I had my own. I was a skeptic of that even. (laughs) I I ridiculed uh, some of those stories. Um, and I knew that he was going to take care of my children. I knew that he was going to, that I just had perfect peace and comfort. Comfort is something that, um, again, almost sounds cliche, but I have never uh, to this day felt absolute comfort and peace as I did then. I was so immersed in his presence and, and he, he carried me through that is, his arm was around me. He never let go. And um, yeah, I didn't really look at my surroundings until uh, after uh, some time. And when I did, the brilliancy of what I was seeing was was just breathtaking to the extreme. Um, it was as though, you know, in this world that we see shades of colors and fragrances and other things that are uh, as though a film was covering them. And in heaven, that film was pulled. And so I saw shades of colors and greens and yellows uh, of I had never seen before, the fragrances of flowers and that I had never experienced in my lifetime. And in my physical, I have a nasal uh, blockage, so I'd never really smelled fully until then. All of my senses were peaked and and my physical uh, ability was was I'd never felt obviously as as good as then, but you know there was a landscape as I mentioned before of the hills and everything was alive. Everything spoke life and life was coming forth before my eyes. And the 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 flowers were growing and there was a river pouring forth. And from my perspective, it seemed like it was coming from Jesus. Everything came alive through the to the waters and the streams. And I looked to the right and I could see these figures and they were um, joyful. And it was a cascading kind of um, kind of like a linen columns and and flowing linens amidst the grass and the beautiful colors of the of the hills and and the landscape and the trees and the flowers and so forth. And um, my sense at that time was that the the joy of the Lord was somehow reflective of the life that they lived, that that was a reward that they had. And the children that I saw were um, extraordinarily joyful. And there was angelic voices just echoing throughout that, it, again, more more brilliant, more uh, harmonious than I'd ever experienced in the most beautiful symphonies I had attended, um, times infinity. And 
I was in a place that I never wanted to leave. And uh, when he said, um, you're going to return, I just didn't want to. And uh, I, um, I said, Lord, please, you know, I don't know. I felt like a kid, you know, going down on Christmas morning and and then being told by his parent that uh, you can't open up the gift. Um, you're going to have to go back upstairs. And uh, I didn't want to go. And I, he said, your purpose has not been fulfilled as yet. Uh, so I wanted to know what that purpose was. You know, why? Why? What is that? Why? How can it be so important? that I would have to leave this place and with you, with you, um, most importantly. And uh, he said, I'll reveal it at, um, at the time that you need it uh, and the moment you need it. Now, some others um, have accounted that they've, he's told them their purpose. But for me, I'm always the type of person that wants to jump ahead, always wants to know and patience and all of that. So I knew for him, that's what I needed um, in hindsight. And he has revealed to me my purpose uh, just exactly as he said he would. And, um, and I just, you know, I just, <laughs> he, he pulled me even closer. And uh, <laughs> And he rested my head on mine. And uh, um, I look one more time. <laughs> and those eyes. And then I woke up. And um, excuse me, there was a couple. I heard this song in heaven. This music playing. Uh, not music playing, t- uh, singing. <laughs> Um, there was a couple singing that same song and, um, at my bedside, I thought, was this Lord, was this them or was it your angels that I was hearing? And I realized something in, um, and the first thing that, that I, that I sensed was the acrid smell of the hospital, the disinfectant. So here I was, I was in paradise and now, now I was in this dark room, you know, people around me and this couple singing uh, at my bedside, um, beautiful uh, song of, uh, of praise. And I realized that uh, somehow that God had enjoined uh, the prayers and the, um, uh, the praises, the song of those people. And it was the same, same exact song that I heard in heaven. And I realized to some extent that the prayers of the saints were joined in the hallways of heaven, if you will, such that uh, they were enjoined um, by by those in heaven and by the Lord to enact his will here on earth. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, um, and that, that was the best day of my life. And, um, and one of the worst days and uh, little did I know that uh, ahead of me would be, uh, some of the even worst days of my life to come, uh, ironically, but I, I had that, uh, I had that relationship and, uh, solid belief and I could always go to the Lord. We were friends. We were friends. It was wonderful. Well, Randy, thank you so much for just sharing that and just, you know, just being you and, you know, and showing the emotion. Um, and as you recall that, I just really appreciate the transparency and the honesty with that. Um, you know, on a practical level, you know, a lot of the authors, you know, uh, friends I work with and whatnot, are seers, they're prophetic. And so I'm curious for you in terms of you processing this experience after the fact, you know, did you have a lot of context for visions and experiences like that? Or was that stuff that you kind of had to process and kind of find a grid to put this in afterwards? Yeah, the prophetic and I had, um, the prophetic word I had for everyone was in the context of trusting the Lord from the perspective of enacting their purpose. Um, That's one thing that is my purpose was really the prophetic and whether it be from an impartation or whether it be to a revelation that the Lord might have 
uh, for me to speak into somebody's life uh, that uh, for their purpose and purpose as we think it of purpose is some, uh, you know, oftentimes on some grandiose scale, you know, my career, I'm going to be doing this or that. It's a moment, it's an event or something or a position. And from the Lord's perspective, I believe that our purpose really is enacted in the moment. And uh, yes, there may be a larger picture, but that 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 is and to give you an example, I was a friend of mine went to the to get his hair cut and, you know, the he got there on the wrong date. He got the wrong date on his calendar. And so there was somebody there that was um, was mourning the grief of uh the loss of her husband. And he found out that his purpose at that moment was not to get a haircut, but it was really to minister to that uh, individual. So, you know, the eyes wide open for those of us who are uh, in Jesus Christ is look, looking for the opportunities to be the uh, face of Christ, to really speak into the person, whether it be at the grocery store, whether it be at, uh, at work, uh, wherever it is to always be ready for the moment that the Lord speaks and speaks a word of encouragement or truth. We don't encourage enough, but also we don't uh, trust enough in the Lord to speak forth the, the wisdom and a message for somebody that could be ever life changing. I met at a book signing somebody who I hadn't seen for years and she referenced um you know, something that was spoken to her that, uh, you know, impacted her for all of those years in between. So prophetically, I would say that the Lord is is drawing, cl- wants to draw close and don't think of those who are and have had gone through NDEs like yours truly, or, truly as having um, some special, uh, some, well, it was special in some context. He wants each of us to draw close to him, to be intimate with them, with us. And that is the central message. You know, people have asked me because I write about, you know, why does God allow suffering? How does he use brokenness? You know, we go through the valley of darkness, but he will never leave us there. Um, And the only answer I can give back to that that really makes any sense whatsoever is that the closer we draw to God, the more those questions that we have and those doubts and uh, that we will no longer have those or they'll be assuaged by virtue of the fact that we are so close to the Lord that maybe we don't know the answers to the questions, but we know who has those answers and that's all that matters. And so it's just like being in heaven, you know, when you're face to face with the Lord, uh, all of those cares evaporate because when you're in the presence of the Lord fully, there will be no, no crying. No, my, my tears, by the way, were of joy and, and just awe, but there will be no crying, no sorrow, no, no worries, no nothing of that kind. And it's the same here on earth. That the closer we go grow to the Lord, the closer closer we immerse ourselves in his presence, the more those cares and worries will evaporate. And I hope that doesn't sound trite, because I can tell you that from my experience in heaven to the experiences I had with the Lord Jesus Christ on earth prior and even subsequent being in my fleshly body, were infinitely apart to the point where I can have experiences with the Lord in his presence and be uh, immersed here on earth. But in heaven, it's a complete immersion. But the irony is that he wants that. He wants that. He desires that same level for us here and now. And when we're immersed in his presence, they have to have life. You know, I have to do this, have to do that, or I want to do this. It becomes innate. It just spills out of us because the closer we get to God, the more he infuses his um, his his direction, his wisdom through us to just do the things that that um, that he's called us to do so that it just spills out of us because it's all about drawing closer to the Lord. And once that happens, you know, putting the, not putting the cart before the horse, putting after, you know, the other things follow. So if you're in a hard place, you know, just draw closer. 
even if you you know are angry at the Lord, as I have been angry at the Lord, just draw closer and be honest with him and say, you know, God, you know, I don't know why you're doing this. I'm angry at you right now. I don't I don't feel close to you right now, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to draw in because I know that you never change, but I do. So I'm going to push forward and just push forward in the hardest times because he's, I've noticed this one thing and I'll end it with this, Sean. I've noticed in, in my life subsequent, it took 14 years for me to share this story because, um, I didn't want to, um, I I thought it was my personal story. It was released actually in an interview that I had for another book. Um, and this thing I've learned is that from my life is that those who are closest to the Lord seem to, and my, these are my experiences, seem to have gone through a significant brokenness in their life. And there are two options that when one goes through brokenness, there are two directions, that is. One can either draw away from God, that is, blame God and, and pull away from him. Or one can draw closer to God and say, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't know why, but I'm just going to draw f- closer to you in prayer and just immersion and stillness and getting still with the Lord. Those who who do the the uh, the latter, they draw closer to God are the ones that have this immense, immense um, love and wisdom uh, beyond those who, let's say, just kind of stroll through life. You know, he's near to the brokenhearted. We know that, uh, you know, John uh, uh, 16, 33, um, you know, he tells us that we're going to have trouble. Uh, but um, and he's near to the brokenhearted for theirs is the kingdom of God, the beatitude. Um, we know that, but it's absolutely true. And it's the only way to live. And um, on that day that we most fear death, on that day that we most fear for our loved one, them dying, will be their best day. I can assure you of that. And I can testify of that. And for anyone who has lost a loved one, I can tell you that uh, uh, they don't want to come back. <laughs> well, and Randy, I, I think uh, one of the burning questions for a lot of the viewers and listeners right now is, did you ever find out what your unfulfilled purpose was? Yeah, I, I, it was actually ironically to help bring purpose to others, to help develop that purpose uh, for or in them or for them. And also to the brokenhearted, you know, I went, as I mentioned, I went through um, probably my darkest times subsequent to my um, being in, ushered into the presence of the Lord. Uh, and I have an affinity now on having worked with the brokenhearted. We're bringing Dying to Meet Jesus to, um, to veterans and active uh, military service members, for example, now, you know, that are going through PTSD and, uh, and, you know, suffering, uh, because there has to be an answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ drawing closer to him. But my purpose really is to help people get through it because we're not through the hump of, you know, why does God allow suffering or why is he allowing me to go through this valley or why did he, you know, take you know my loved one? If we can't get beyond that, then we're not going to get to the larger purpose of, OK, what am I here for? What what is why did this happen? You know, and I call those. Um, times when we've gone through crises and we gone, have gone through loss and uh, changes, loss of a job even, they call them seminal moments. You know, seminal moments are life-changing moments. They're cataclysmic. They change us forever. We lose our job. We have to do something else. We lose our loved one. Now what do I do? Things, I've lost my health. You know, I have cancer. What is? What am I supposed to do now? And so I, I want to encourage people to to kind of do a paradigm shift and look at this and plan those seminal moments in advance instead of waiting for that loved one to pass, instead of late waiting for that terminal illness, instead of waiting for that loss of the job. Now, 
presume those having as having occurred because those catapult us to to hopefully a different place and not the same because same is truly never the same but if we truly look at that okay and and open that kind of what if box now you know if i lost that now what could i do uh what would i do that maybe has been on the back burner that maybe was a dream that was lost because the practicality of life got in the way and now i can say okay Now, without having gone through that seminal moment, that uh, crisis, how about if I think of it in the in the context or the paradigm of, okay, it's happened. So now what do I do with my life? Because my life changed dramatically. I mean, I was in the corporate world. I was doing business. I, I went into training and development, personal development into ministry because some of those people dropped away because, you know, now they kind of think of me differently now that, uh, you know, I had never written a quote unquote Christian book and certainly not a near death experience. So some people are looking at me differently. So I'm in a whole different uh, arena and um, I know I didn't have to die to be there. Um, For me, I did. Um, but I, I now think of things from the context of, okay, Lord, uh, I don't want to wait for that. I want to plan ahead accordingly for what you want me to do um, when the proverbial rug has been pulled out from under my feet uh, so that maybe you don't have to do it uh, so I can get through my thick head and, and I'm supposed to do something that's that's more kingdom, uh, has more kingdom impact than what I'm doing uh, today. Um, that's, that's, um, that's what I want to help people understand and to help people find that purpose and get through that brokenness so they can strive toward, toward, uh, greater things and drawing closer to Christ. Well, Randy, when people hear a story like yours or they read a book like Dying to Meet Jesus, I think a a lot of times they'll get hung up on the near death experience and and that'll be the one thing they remember or take away. But in in terms of you know the reader's journey with this book, when when somebody gets to that last that last page, they close that back flap. What's that one thing you want every single reader to take away? What do you want them to remember most from the book? I want them to remember that our greatest fear uh, is actually our greatest joy because of this one fact, and it comes in Romans eight twenty eight. All things, all. All things work for good to those that belong to Christ Jesus and are called according to his purpose. And so that that whatever the bad is, the inevitable outcome is good. And that means even at the point of death, because our best day is not here on earth. Our best day begins at the point at which we actually physically die. So that's our best day. But our best day here is is that point at which we then uh, die to self. That is, we give up, you know, and oftentimes that takes brokenness to give up and let God do his work. You know, don't take it personally if somebody, you know, fires you. You know, God, other people's rejection is God's redirection. Oftentimes, just just go with the flow. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Because always, always, always bad will be turned for good. It's inevitable. And even in the darkest time, he will never, never leave us there. It's always for a redemptive purpose. And he taught us on the cross. He, he redeemed us on the cross. And every, every tragedy, whether it be Job or personal tragedies, my losses, I've had cancer, um, heart disease, lung disease, obviously, as I, as I mentioned, all of those things have served a redemptive purpose. Even If it's speaking with whomever's out there now, that's a redemptive purpose that I would never want to sacrifice uh, in my life. So every hardship is the loss of loved ones, which I describe in the book, um, you know, that had a redemptive purpose. And so nothing bad happens without some redemption for good coming out of that bad thing that happened. And so if you think of that from that context, then you're going to think of, okay, now I'm going through the valley, but now I'm going to go through something better, something good. And it's going to be used because I've trusted the Lord. And uh, and that's my takeaway. Well, Randy, thank you. For, <laughs> Long takeaway. Thank you for helping us to wrap up on such an encouraging note. 
Uh, for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about the book, where are some of the places we can connect with you on the web? Yeah, I have an author site at randykauthor.com. And then I have um, the, the ministry site. I have a training site as well. But for those who might want to get engaged more um, Christian oriented on uh, randyk.org. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Randy and pick up your very own copy of the book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Randy Kay. Once again, our book today was Dying to Meet Jesus, How Encountering Heaven Changed My Life. For more on Randy and the book, a great place to start is his website, randykauthor.com. And as you mentioned, if you want to connect with him related to more ministry and speaking engagement sorts of things, head on over to randykay.org. And Randy, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Likewise, Sean.